Greetings, fellow mathematicians. We're going to take a look at one of the most important formulas in all of science, engineering, and mathematics with something known as Euler's formula. Now, this formula is completely non-obvious, so there's no real simple way to motivate it. So let's just go ahead and state it. And the version that we're going to start with is the standard version, e to the ix. It's going to establish a relationship between exponential functions. And on the right side, there's trig functions. Euler's formula is e to the ix equals cosine of x plus i times sine of x. And here, i is the imaginary unit square root of negative 1. Now, this formula is completely non-obvious, but there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do with it, which is the purpose of this video. So, let's just go ahead and start by plugging in values for x. Let's go with values that are nice to plug into trig functions. Let's start with x as pi. All right, and we get e to the i pi equals cosine of pi plus i times sine of pi. Hopefully you remember your basic trig values, sine and cosine of special angles. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi is 0. So if we plug that in, we get this interesting relationship, e to the i pi equals now negative 1. And we can actually rewrite that by adding 1 to the other side, and we get this relationship, e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And that is sometimes referred to as Euler's identity, and it relates the five most important numbers in mathematics, or arguably five of the most important numbers at least, 0, 1, e, i, and pi all together in a very simple formula. Many mathematicians, scientists, and engineers consider either Euler's identity or Euler's formula as one of the most beautiful equations in all of mathematics. If you're just learning this formula for the first time, that's probably not sinking in, but give it time as you progress through your mathematical journey, you'll start to see the importance of Euler's formula. All right, let's go ahead and plug in another value for x. Let's go with pi over 2. All right, we'll plug that in on both sides. On the left, we get e to the i pi over 2. And on the right side, cosine of pi over 2 plus i times sine of pi over 2. All right, again, we're going to resort to our basic trig values. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And sine of pi over 2 is 1. And it looks like on the right-hand side, we're just left with i times 1, or i. So we get this interesting result, e to the i pi over 2 equals i. All right, that's moderately interesting. Let's get an even more interesting result. We probably shouldn't be doing this right now, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to raise both sides to an imaginary power. We're going to raise each side to the i power. Let's go ahead and do that. On the right side, we get i to the i. And on the left side, we get e to the i pi over 2. And again, we raise that to the i power. This is going to lead us to a mind-blowing result because on the right side we have i to the i, an imaginary number raised to an imaginary number. And notice what we're going to get on the left side. We're not going to prove the exponent rules, but they basically work. i times i, that comes out to negative 1. 
make sure you're comfortable with your basic relationships. If i is square root of negative 1, then we define i squared as negative 1. All right, so you have an outer and inner power. You multiply them, and it looks like what we'll get on that left side is e to the negative pi over 2. And again, the negative here is coming from i times i, i squared, which is negative 1. And that is a mind-blowing result. i to the i, an imaginary number raised to an imaginary number, that actually comes out on the left side to be a real number. Now, there's more to this. There's some things I'm not discussing and talking about right now, but they'll be introduced later at an appropriate point in your mathematical journey. All right, now this is just plugging in values for x. As interesting as this is, let's go ahead and establish some other relationships between exponential functions and trig functions. The link that establishes that relationship are imaginary numbers. Now, this is going to be our starting formula, and we're going to need a related one, and we're going to make a replacement in this formula everywhere. Let's replace x with negative x. All right, let me write this out in full detail. On the left side, we get e to the negative ix. And on the right side, we'll get cosine of negative x, and then plus i times sine of negative x. Now, as it turns out, we can actually simplify the right side here by using what are called the even and odd properties of sine and cosine. You might recall that cosine is an even function. And that allows you, when you plug in a negative, just doesn't matter for an even function. And sine is an odd function. And when you have a negative inside an odd function, you can pull that negative out front and we can write this as negative sine of x. All right, so let's make use of the even and odd properties here. Cosine of negative x is just cosine of x. Sine of negative x, I get an extra negative, which I'll pull out front. So I'll write this right-hand side as cosine of x, but now minus i times sine of x. And that gives us our second useful identity. Euler's formula is the first formula. This is the second one that we're going to use to get some other relationships. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at what those relationships are. We're going to think of trying to convert from complex exponentials to trig functions and vice versa. Conversions should work in both directions. Let's go ahead and take a look at those relationships that allow us to convert in both directions. Now that we have our first relationship that comes from Euler's formula, let's go ahead and establish some other ones, and these will allow us to do a lot of interesting stuff with them. Now, let's go ahead and observe for these two formulas thinking of these like we might systems of equations, what would happen if I add these together? Well, notice you have a like term here, i sine of x, but with different signs, they're going to add to zero. So if I take these two formulas and first add them together, let's go ahead and add the left sides we'll get e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. Those are not like terms, so we can't add or combine them together. 
and adding the right hand sides together, we have cosine plus cosine, that'll give us two cosine of x. And what we can do from here is solve this for cosine of x and get a really interesting identity. Let's just go ahead and divide by two and we'll get cosine of x equals one half times e to the ix plus e to the minus ix. And that is not only really interesting, but also really useful for some other videos that we'll be getting to after this. Now, here we had the sine terms canceling out by adding. Well, let's go ahead and try something similar. Let's go ahead and subtract these equations. And let's subtract them in this order. Let's take the top equation and we'll subtract the bottom one. So we'll do this one minus this one, minus a negative, that really becomes plus. So we'll subtract our left sides, e to the ix minus e to the negative ix. And on the right side, your cosine terms subtract out, cosine of x minus cosine of x is zero. And just be careful with your signs. We have i sine of x minus negative i sine of x. Minus a negative is plus. So on the right side, we get 2i times sine of x. And we can solve this for sine of x, but now we're gonna divide by 2i. So we get this interesting identity, sine of x equals one over 2i and then times e to the ix minus e to the negative ix. And these are going to be extremely useful identities that allow us to convert back and forth between complex exponentials and trig functions in both directions. Now, let me just go ahead and write these side by side with another set of similar identities. So let's start with cosine of x. We have that as one half e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. And below that, I'll put the identity for sine, sine of x as one over two i e to the ix, now minus e to the negative ix. And depending on what you covered in your previous calculus courses, you might have introduced what are called hyperbolic trig functions. Let's go ahead and write down the definitions for hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. These look like hyperbolic cosine of x sometimes called cosh of x. And we have a similar hyperbolic sine of x. Now these are just in terms of basic exponential functions with no imaginary units. These might look familiar, they might not, but they, these are defined, these hyperbolic trig functions as one half times e to the x plus e to the negative x, there's a factor of a half, and hyperbolic sine is very similar, one half, e to the x minus e to the negative x. And now you might notice these two sets of relationships look very similar. They both involve trig functions or hyperbolic trig functions, and on the right sides, exponential functions, but the difference, these versions, there's no imaginary units. In other words, these combinations of exponentials, real exponentials, give hyperbolic trig functions. 
These combinations of complex exponentials, they give trig functions. Now, there is some more to this. In other words, there's a much deeper part to this, but let's go ahead and finish with what the relationships are between hyperbolic trig functions and trig functions. And what I'm going to do is plug i x into these two hyperbolic trig functions. So let's go ahead and start. First, taking hyperbolic cosine of x, and we're going to make a replacement, x going to ix. All right, so if we do that first for hyperbolic cosine, we get hyperbolic cosine of ix. Make that replacement x going to ix on the right side, we get 1 half. Now times e to the ix plus e to the negative ix. And if you notice from the other identities that we still have on the board here, this is exactly regular, plain old vanilla cosine of x. And that is interesting. There is a relationship between hyperbolic cosine and cosine. The link between them is the imaginary unit. Now, we can do the same thing for hyperbolic sine. Let's go ahead and replace x with ix there. So we get hyperbolic sine of i times x, and that equals 1 half e to the ix, there's the minus, and then e to the negative ix. And this is close to being regular sine of x, but we're missing a factor of i in the denominator. So let's just go ahead and multiply and divide by i. Notice I have a factor of i in the denominator. I have a factor of i out front. You can cancel them out, and that would cancel to 1 half. And now I keep the part in parentheses the same, e to the ix minus e to the negative ix. And now we get a related result to this, but there's an extra factor of i. This part right here, we're going to replace that with sine of x. And the identity we get is that hyperbolic sine of ix equals i times sine of x. And those are interesting results, but what they're going to allow us to do is establish a connection between trig functions, regular trig functions, cosine and sine of x, possibly for other values of x that are not standard inputs. We can reverse this instead of plugging ix into your hyperbolic trig functions. You could also plug imaginary values like ix into your regular trig functions. And Euler's formula and its related results completely establish those relationships. What we're going to see in a follow-up video, the main use of all these relationships, we're going to establish a way to find values for trig functions beyond being between negative 1 and 1. So we'll take a look at a link to a video where we'll solve sine of x equals 2. Hope you enjoyed this video establishing Euler's formula and everything related to it. We're going to be doing a lot of interesting stuff with this. Those videos will be linked below. If you enjoyed the content, support the channel, hit the subscribe button.